There's no denying that the rise and rule of Adolf Hitler was an astonishing, shocking and overwhelmingly evil moment in human history. He wiped out one third of an entire people, the Jewish people, conquered much of a continent. And one of the things that fascinates and bewilders many people, especially historians, was his downright obsession with the Jews and trying to wipe them out. But what people who are well versed in the Torah, in the Bible, cannot help but notice are the remarkable parallels between the rise of Hitler and a people and a few particular characters from that people of an ancient nation that the Torah talks about called the nation of Amalek. So who were Amalek? Well, there was once a man called Amalek. He was the grandson of Esau, Esau who was uh, a child, the twin son of Isaac alongside his twin brother, Jacob. And he has a grandson called Amalek. And the Torah then talks about the nation that came from Amalek, the nation of Amalek, which tried to attack the Jewish people when they were in the desert. And it's particularly striking because the biblical commentaries tell us that all the nations of the world, once they heard about what happened to the Egyptians, they kind of backed off from, from the Jews when they went into the desert. And yet Amalek, when all the other nations were scared to attack, were prepared to go and attack uh, the Jewish people. We also know that we've got the festival of Purim coming up. And we know that the arch enemy of the Jewish people, the, what, the, the man who rises to the top of an entire society and empire, the Persian empire, uh, he tries to wipe out the entire Jewish people across basically the world. And his name was Haman. And he was an Amalekite. And what sets Amalek apart from other you know, foes of the Jewish people or Israel throughout history is that Amalek has an unrelenting, philosophical, fundamentally uh, rooted opposition to the Jewish people. Now, why is that? Well, Rabbi Sadok HaKohen, who lived in the 19th century, he wrote that, quote, in the history of mankind, Amalek symbolizes the foremost evil among the nations always has risen up to destroy Israel when the time of redemption is imminent. And in man's heart, Amalek represents the power that freezes man, causing him to see only absurd chance and therefore deny an ethical conscience and the moral perfection it entails. If the Jewish people's mission and role is to connect the world to God, Amalek's role is to try to stop that connection, to sever that connection. So it's interesting, if you read the, the first time that the, the nation of Amalek tried to attack the Jewish people when they're in the desert after they've left Egypt, the words you see immediately before it says an Amalek came to attack is the Jewish people questioned, is God with us or not? And at that moment, boom, the Amalekites come. It's almost as if the Torah is telling us that's the, po the power that Amalek thrives on. And on a sort of symbolic, spiritual level, perhaps, um, it's seized on Israel's weakness in that department of trusting in God, of, of connecting to God, of clinging to God. And in a sense, its power grew because that's what they thrive on. They thrive on doubt, doubting God's presence, God's existence, perhaps, but also his uh, providence and, and involvement in our lives. And in fact, the, the numerical value, the gematria, which is the Hebrew num numerical value of words, of doubt, suffolk, suffolk is doubt in Hebrew, is the same as Amalek. They both have the same numerical value because that's what Amalek thrives on. And so the commentaries tell us that Amalek is not just about, let's say, one person or a nation, but it also represents a spiritual force within the world that all of us have to contend with to some degree, uh, which is that force of doubt, of not being confident in doing what's right, what's moral, and trusting in God, and all the rest of it. 
and that's actually what we learn was is introduced into the world when Adam and Eve ate from the tree. They, what was introduced was doubt, that lack of certainty uh, of God's uh, existence and, and uh, care and connection with all of us. And so therefore, at least at a conceptual level, the Torah demands of the Jewish people to, to eradicate that, that force, that spiritual force that exists. If that's what they're trying to do, to basically create a godless world, a world in which we don't have confidence in God's providence and his uh, uh, desire for us to be good, and well, what's the consequence of that? Well, the consequence of that is a world of lawlessness, certainly from a moral perspective. Now, what did Hitler want? Well, let me quote to you first a song of the Hitler Youth that uh, they sung. And it went like this, we are the joyous Hitler youth. We do not need our Christian virtue. Our leader is our savior. The Pope and the rabbi shall be gone. We want to be pagans once again. So you see here in pretty clear and certain terms what they were looking for. Now, Hitler did work with the church, but he saw that very much as a means to an end. For him, he believed that both Christianity and Marxism were these sort of utopian visions for the world that talked about caring for the weak and the vulnerable, but they all stem from those Jewish concepts of morality and he wanted to rid the world of them. So it was really just a means to an end for him. In truth, his vision for the world was a pagan world. He said, quote, it is true we are barbarians. He said this in an interview in a conversation with a man called Hermann Rauschning. He said, it's an honorable title to us, I'm coming to free humanity from the shackles of the soul, from the degrading suffering caused by this false vision called conscience and morality. The Jews have inflicted two wounds on mankind, circumcision on its body and conscience on its soul. These are Jewish inventions. The war for world domination will be fought entirely between us, the Germans and the Jews. All else is facade and illusion. He could not have been clearer, and Hitler's actions prove that he really believed this. For example, with the Nazi invasion of Hungary in 1944, top German military officials determined that railway lines must be prioritized to transport vital troops and equipment to the battlefront. And the Wehrmacht urged Hitler to provide this um, infusion of desperately needed supplies, but Hitler ignored their warnings and instead gave orders to allocate the precious rail lines to deport hundreds of thousands of Hungarian Jews en masse to the extermination camps. And historians acknowledge that this decision was a key factor in further debilitating the German war effort. And it seems very clear that Hitler was more concerned with killing Jews. And, he, and, and this wasn't, um, from his perspective, he was being entirely coherent philosophically. That was more important to him in the end. And his, in his final radio address, when he was in his bunker and he knew it was all over, he said, I implore the Germans to uphold the racial laws to, you know, to be as strict as possible. I mean, it's, it's, it's remarkable, but if you understand or, or see this through the lens of the Amalekite philosophy, it does start to fit uh, a coherent picture. Another little interesting thing that I thought I'd throw in that is just completely spine tingling is that the Gemara, the Talmud, written thousands of years ago, right? In the Middle East, it says, quote, this is in Tractate Megillah 6b. It talks about a nation that descended from the line of Esau, Asav. And it says, Rav Yitzhak asked, what is meant by the verse, O God, don't grant the desires of the evil man and don't let him draw out his bit lest he raise himself above others. This refers to Gamamia of Edom. For should they go forth, they would destroy the entire world. Rabbi Chama Barachanina said, there are 300 crown princes in Germamia, or it'd be J, but there's no, that's a gimel, you wouldn't pronou you'd pronounce it G in, in Hebrew, but it could be J, uh, Germamia of Edom. There are 300 crown princes in Germamia of Edom. So there is this monarchy from the kingdom of Edom, which is Esau, um, Esau, that called, the, the, the town that refers to as Germamia, and it refers to 300 crown princes. Now, we actually know for a fact that by the end of the Middle Ages, Britain and France emerged as unified nations 
but Germany remained a crazy patchwork of some, you guessed it, 300 individual states. Now, this could just be a, a coincidence. Um, I doubt that. Uh, it, it's, it's pretty remarkable, the, the connections that we find um, between the philosophy of Amalek um, and some of the specific writings that the rabbis wrote thousands of years ago about this nation called Amalek. Now, here's one final thing to leave you with. I quoted earlier Rabbi Sadok HaKohen, who wrote in the 19th century that in the history of mankind, quote, Amalek symbolizes the foremost evil among the nations and has always risen up to destroy Israel when the time of redemption is imminent. Now, think about the times that we know Amalek rose up to destroy the Jewish people. The first time was in the desert. What was happening? They were on their way to go to the land of Israel, to the promised land. The second time, Haman tries to wipe out the Jews. What happened there? They were in exile. And what happens after the Purim story? They are allowed to return to rebuild their temple. So again, you have Amalek attacking just before redemption and return to Israel is imminent. Now, if our theory is correct, that Hitler was indeed an Amalekite, carrying on that tradition of thousands of years, isn't it remarkable that what did we see in the years just after the Holocaust and the downfall of Hitler, we see the most dramatic, magnificent, remarkable return of the Jewish people en masse to their home, to the land of Israel. So there we are. There's a very strong case, I believe, to make that Hitler was an Amalekite, certainly embodied their philosophy. But for me, the most remarkable thing is how these things that we learn in the Torah, these ideas, these values, these people, it, it's so alive. It's still just as relevant. And it shows us that this is a living Torah. It's an ongoing story that's continuing to unfold and that we're a part of. And if we only were able to just open our eyes a little bit and look into things in just a little bit more depth, a little bit be beneath the surface, we will see an incredible tapestry story unfold before our eyes. I'm Ollie Annersfeld and you're watching JTV.